These that are around the front just continue praying. They're going to just continue praying for these needs. Those of you that are in your seats still, and maybe those of you that are joining online. We mentioned this last week, and, and today marks the start of 30 days that we've agreed as a body to pray for our nation. And uh, boy, when I think about a, a different, any other thing that needs healing, our nation fits right into the middle of that space where we just need God to heal our land, right? We read it last week that the, the promises of God are still true. If we, as his people, will humble ourselves and pray that, that he'll hear from heaven and uh, and heal our land. And, and in a moment, we'll mention this, but there's there's a guide that we're going to be uh, putting on different social media things and uh, uh, different uh, opportunities for you to agree together with us for the next 30 days in prayer for our nation. Today, as we start off, the, the, the guide is this, that we're going to agree together for this. Just as pray for a great move of God. There's an estimated only 6% of Americans have a truly biblical worldview. Many Christians don't know how to carefully look at life through a biblical lens. I believe that's true, and I've seen it, seen it play out. But can you just join your hearts with mine and with those that are around the world and around in, in our nation that are setting aside some time this morning to pray for our nation, that, that God would open up our eyes in the church, but also those that don't even know Christ yet that they would begin to see the truths of Scripture lived out in front of them many times through our lives, right? That God uses that to change. Can we just join our hearts together in that prayer focus here today for our nation? Father, I pray right now, together with all of these that are in this room here today and those that are joining online and all over this nation, God, I pray for the United States of America. God, I pray that you would hear from heaven and heal our land. God, I thank you that you have given us an opportunity to live in a nation where we enjoy freedom to worship you. And God, I pray that you would allow us to understand the unique responsibility that that affords to us, Lord, in your plan, in your purposes, that God, as we begin to see the world, not through economics or through political or social, but we see the world and the things that are going on through a biblical perspective. God, I pray that as we do that, it would join our hearts to a heart of prayer like never before, that God, we would just uh, humble ourselves, we would examine our own lives, and we would seek your face. And God, I pray that you would, would change the hearts that are in this nation today. God, I pray for the leadership of this nation, those that know you as Savior and those that do not. I pray that in the halls of uh, state houses and, and courtrooms and government buildings all over this nation, that the believers that have your spirit in them would raise up a standard, would begin to be bold in their proclamation of this biblical worldview, that those that are, are, are not in, in the family of God yet would be begin to see something different, not a divisive, not a, a hateful approach, but one of love and compassion, but of truth that your Bible, that your lens of, of how we should see life would just permeate in all areas of this nation. God, I pray for the leadership even this week that have decisions to be made. God, I pray that you would give them moments of clarity in seeing the truths of Scripture, that they would allow your word to, 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 to permeate their hearts in their decision-making processes and all that they have to do. God, we thank you. We thank you for all that you do, for hearing our prayers. I thank you in advance for the healing that has taken place around these altars. God, I, I thank you in advance for the testimonies of what you are doing in and through our lives. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Thank you so much for just allowing us to kind of shift our agenda here today. That's all right. It's a good thing. And I, we, we celebrate um, with, uh, with baptism. You know what? That, uh, it's Santana, right? Am I, or Savannah. Did I get the name? I, 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 yeah. There you go. Thank you. Where are you at? There, there she is. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sorry. I butchered your name. I, pro I apologize. 
But you know, you know what's exciting about this is we, we do have a regular rhythm of those times that, that we you know, have the baptism taken out here. And uh, that, that was not even a planned thing, that God just spoke something in early service. And, and it was, that's awesome. And I would just say to you, um, if you're here in this room and you say, you know what, I've never followed the Lord's uh, commands in Scripture to be baptized. And today, God's speaking to you. You know what? We'll stay after service today and we'll, we'll allow you. We'll have, a peop- we'll have a group around and we'll baptize more people today. Because I, I just think that's, that's something that we should take advantage of when we have the opportunity. And, and God does that. There's a pattern in Scripture for that. And uh, we're excited about what God is doing in and through your life. So uh, we just we celebrate with you, um, Santana. It's exciting to see what God is doing. Well, God is doing some incredible things here at Calvary and all over the world through your faithfulness and giving. In the last couple of weeks, we've talked about this as far as when we come to this moment in, in our services, we always want to um, intentionally hit pause in the, the flow and say, God, there's, there's a way that we worship, and that's through our giving as well. We can sing songs, and we can pray together. These are all in the Bible. This is what we believe as a church. If it's in the Bible, there's a pattern for, for the, in the scriptures, then, then we just want to flow in that. And one of the ways we continue in our worship is through our giving. And so I'm going to encourage you to continue to do that. Scripture tells us that we bring to the Lord his tithes and then our offerings. That tithes is that first 10%. And can I just encourage you, some of you are very generous in your giving, and yet the, the tithes has been a little bit of a, of a hard thing for you to grasp. That's foundational for, for obedience to Scripture. And God may be speaking to you today that that tithe is the area of growth in your life. So we just, I, I think God um, honors his word, and he does that. And he says that he will honor those, those that obey him in his tithes. And so we bring to the Lord our, his tithes and also our offerings. We can do that a lot of different ways. Physically, there's envelopes in the seat pockets there in front of you. You can give online, uh, calvarytriad.com slash give, and it walks you through that process. You can also text to give, and you text the amount to the number 84321. Well, for the last couple of weeks, we've been focusing on and, and launched a couple of weeks ago this idea of kingdom builders. And the, the premise is this, that when, when Jesus walked this earth, he, he began to instill into the disciples this idea of a kingdom mentality, that when he came, his purpose was to establish, once again, his kingdom on this earth. It's a spiritual kingdom, and we are still in the continuation of building his kingdom. And so kingdom builders is just the, the verbiage that we attach to our expression of fulfilling the heart and the the mission of of God. And it's exciting. If you haven't had a chance um, to walk through the the lobbies in between the South Lobby and the West Lobby here, we've just started calling it kind of the Kingdom Builders Gallery. And there's there's purpose to that so that you could see what God is doing in and through your giving, but also just spend time to to pray over those different ministries that God is allowing us to take part in and be a, a partner with. So that's, I encourage you to be involved in that. But Kingdom Builders already has had some significant impacts, both locally uh, and and global impact, and then also in the future. I'm going to ask Pastor Tom to come and help me with just a little update and then a push as to where we're at with Kingdom Builders and going forward. Thank you, Pastor Tom. I I was needing that early service, so you're on the ball. Um, I I just, I I want us to get a little bit of understanding of, of kind of where we're at current reality um, as it relates to Kingdom Builders and kind of where we're heading for the rest of this year. Yeah, so when we launched Kingdom Builders, um, we had a goal uh, by the end of this year giving a half million dollars to missions locally, globally, and future into the next generation. And um, if you haven't stopped by Kingdom Builders Gallery, pick up one of these if you weren't with us on that Sunday. It's got all kinds of information in here who we're partnering with, uh, the missionaries. But thus far, we have, you have already given over $100,000 towards that annual goal. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, I've got a, a Kingdom Builders Committee put together, and I think now I have five requests uh, of how we're going to begin uh, just partnering with others and, and spending that money and seeing God's kingdom uh, 
expanded. Awesome, awesome. So we're, we're a good ways there to, the, to where our goal is. Our goal is not to just have this fund that sits there. Obviously, there's outflow. It's an in and out fund, right, that goes in and out. Um, and then each month, we're going to tackle a project. This month, it's significant um, because today, in just a moment, we're going to be sharing a message about Pentecost. And, and now, the first service, you stole a little bit of my thunder here, Pastor Tom. So anyway, no, I'm teasing. I'm going to steal a little um, bit more. <laughs> but talk, uh, the idea of Pentecost, We'll hear from, we'll see in scripture in a minute, this idea of languages and and the scripture and the truth of the gospel being in different languages. God's put a special burden on your heart. Yeah. So when Pastor John um, assigned kingdom builders to me uh, at the first of the year, um, Kenda and I, we went to a, a missions conference down in Florida. And during the course of that conference, God just burst something in my heart, um, and that is to help provide translation of the Bible into a, a language that it's never been translated before. And so kind of set that aside a little bit. And we've been developing Kingdom Builders and we launched it last month. And, and as I was thinking about, well, what's our focus going to be here in June? Um, the Lord just kind of surfaced that again. And so if you look through here, you'll see that every tribe, every nation, um, they partner with over 40 um, Bible translators like Whitecliffe, um, American Bible Society, U version, with the goal of by the year 20 or yeah 2033 that scriptures will be translated into every language in the world. It's an incredible goal. Yeah. So a few years ago, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to travel to the Museum of the Bible in D.C. It was incredible. We sat in a room. It was a really special meeting with Mark. Uh, Mark Green, or the Green family, Hobby Lobby family, and he's a part of this group that they begin to say statements like that as far as, you know, when you have goals in business, it's, it's one thing to have a small goal. It's another thing to have this, like, big, un- incredible, audacious goal. And he said that statement in that room that says, we're here to eradicate biblical poverty on the planet. Like, that's a big statement, right? And you say, wow, well, how do we start that? Well, every tribe, every nation is a piece of that vision, right? Yeah. And so as I was thinking about, well, what, what nation, what language would we tackle? Um, I began to look. There's 7,000 languages across the globe. And I was shocked to discover only half of those have received the scriptures translated in their language. And as I went through and began to look page after page, uh, people group after people group, I just began to weep because so many have never heard what you and I take for granted. The words we sang in worship, we all understand it's our heart language because we have the scripture in our language. And so God laid it upon my heart um, in Togo, Africa. There's over a million people that speak the Kabi language. And in 2006, translators began translating the Bible, and they're a year out from having that finished. And it cost Pastor John 26,000, excuse me, $23,465 a year um, that they've been investing in these translators. And so the Lord has put it on my heart. It's like, that is here in this room. That is something the Calvary Church can do. We can... We can push them over the the finish line, and we can help provide the complete Bible in the Kabi language to over a million people by next year. That's awesome. That's awesome. So here's what's been amazing. The last couple months, what we've seen is that God just kind of drops different um, um, vision and and, uh, generosity elements into all of our hearts. Had a couple of conversations last week after service that God was just stirring in, in people's hearts to to just be involved and do that. And, and boy, isn't that cool that, that, yes, there is a result and the beneficiary of our generosity is this language there. But the truth of it is, can I let you in on a little secret, that sometimes it's more about what God is doing in our hearts than it really is about the money. And so we just believe that every time we come up against the need, we say, okay, God speak. And he does do that. So Pastor Tom, I'm going to ask you to pray for for us in the room that through this next month, we're going to be focusing on this particular language. And through Kingdom Builders, we're going to be be asking God to just speak to your your hearts. And maybe God's saying, hey, have a part in this. And uh, I believe the need will be met. So yeah. 
And before I pray, Go for I it. believe this is providential today because I, uh, I should have realized that this is Pentecost Sunday. I should have read my emails from the national office, et cetera, promoting the Sunday. All right. But it was last night as I was quieting my heart and thinking about this and thinking about the service that I just felt prompted to go read chapter two of Acts and you're going to hear about it. But the thing that amazed me that I just really hadn't seen before because I'm on the other side, I've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the thing that the miracle of Pentecost for me last night as I looked at that was it wasn't about the believers receiving the Holy Spirit so much as it was about the people who heard the believers speaking God's wonders in their language. And so I did a quick Google search, the ancient, all the people that he's going to show that were there, there were over 17 languages represented. And for the first time, many of them heard the wonders of God being proclaimed in their own language. And that's what set them up to receive the gospel that day. So don't mean to steal your thunder. Father, we thank you so much that in your divine providence here on Pentecostal Sunday, when we enjoy the word of God and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Lord, you have positioned us for such a time as this to be able to help translate the Bible and the Kabi language. Lord, I pray that as that comes to completion next year, I pray, Father, that hundreds of thousands of Kabi people would come to know the living Savior. They'd come to be able to read John 3.16 in their own language that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal yes. life. Yes. God, you can do that. Use this, I pray, in the grace of giving as we just sow generously in the kingdom builders for your name's sake. Amen. 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 God is doing an incredible work through Kingdom Builders, and here's the series we're in. It ties right into it. The story continues. The story of God's plan through man is continuing even to this day, whether it's through Kingdom Builders or through a young lady being baptized here, through the ministries that are represented here, through student ministry and, and kids ministry. <clears throat> Excuse me. The story continues. And so turning your Bibles to Acts chapter two, and Pastor Tom did it again. He stole my thunder. He's just, you know, I don't know. There's rebellion and I'm just teased. But uh, isn't it cool that God is confirming and God's drawing us into the same place where it, it all fits. Like it, it's all part of what God is doing. And I just think that's beautiful. That's awesome. I love what God's doing, even in the pastoral staff here uh, at Calvary. So Acts chapter 2 is where we're at today in this series. And let me remind you, uh, if maybe you're joining with us in this series for the first time today, we kind of made a commitment to ourselves as we go through Acts, and really it's a commitment that we should make to ourselves as we approach Scripture in any way, but that we would come into to this study of this book of the Bible and not put our life experience or our opinions as a lens through which we viewed scripture or, or, or interpreted it, but we would just, as kind of a, of a whole body, we would step back and let the scripture speak for itself. Now, there is beauty and there is wisdom in understanding the context of when it was written, and we will do that, but so many times we come into to this, this study of Scripture in a preaching moment, and we bring opinions, we bring experience, we bring our, our different uh, uh, types of life um, you know, challenges or whatever into Scripture, and let's... Let's just see what God does when we don't do that. Can I be honest with you? This message today is about Pentecost. It is Pentecost Sunday, and we are a Pentecostal church. So even when I say that, there's all of these things that flood through your mind, right, as to what that means. Can I be honest with you? I grew up in a Pentecostal church. I grew up in an Assemblies of God church. And we had all different types of expression as to what that meant. Some of it was biblical. Others, par other parts of it was just us as humans being humans. And can I just kind of let you be free a little bit in this? 
as we, as flawed humans, begin to come into contact with God's word and ask him, God, how do you play that out in our lives in church and individuals and family? Can I tell you this? We're not always going to get it right. That's why the community of believers going through and asking the Holy Spirit to reveal and teach us in all truth is so important. That's why being involved in church is so important. There's a pattern there for us wrestling with scripture and saying, God, speak to us and lay out the pattern um, that you would have us to, to live in our lives as well. So today, this idea of Pentecost we, we celebrate this, this Sunday as kind of a Pentecost Sunday, and you'll see why that's significant here in just a minute. But it's in Acts chapter 2, the first 13 verses is where we're going to be today. It starts off this. It says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers, say that with me, all the believers, all the believers, these people that you're about to see what takes place in their lives they were like you and I. So many of you that are in this room today have already asked Jesus to come into your life. You're, you would be what we would call a believer, a follower of Christ. Some of you in this room, you say, well, that's not me. That's all right. That's great. You're here in the word and, and God's going to give you an opportunity even today to, to be a part of that group. And that's exciting. But on the day of Pentecost, all of the believers were meeting together in one place. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages. One version says other tongues, as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability Quick note on this. Remember, who's the author of the book of Acts? Luke. Luke was a physician, a physician that was very concerned with the details and the specificity of what was happening. So there wasn't a lot of, of flamboyant, poetic, poetic language. There was just, here's what I see. Here's what's happening. We are witnesses of that. And it, Luke says that a lot of different places in the book of Acts. So when you read something like this that feels very dramatic, very like, wow, there's a movie to be made here, right? This is something to understand that there was, there was probably some very um, detailed description of what exactly took place. And that's tremendous. That's awesome. And so it goes on to says, at the time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. And when they heard this loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed, as we would be. How can this be, they explained. They exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Interesting, if you do study this statement that these people were all, all from Galilee, that was not a compliment that was them saying, these are uneducated. These, all them Galileans, they're from Galilee, and yet they're speaking in all these other languages. That was significant for their un understanding of what was taking place. It goes on, it says, here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. I feel like I'm speaking in tongues just reading that verse, right? You know, it's, that's an impressive thing to get through that. But these are all over the region. These were the people that were represented, seeing people speak in their language. And they said, and we, hear, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. Key to get that, the tongues pointed people to God. They did not point people to the, the people, they pointed people to God. They, they were speaking about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? We would have all asked the same thing. They asked each other. Many of us would have stood, stopped on that and asked that. Some of us may have asked the next question or made the next comment that they made as well. But others in the crowd ridiculed them saying, they're just drunk, that's all. And 
so funny. It, I'm always wondering if people are going to kind of chuckle and laugh at that. It's okay. That's kind of, I, I chuckled and I'm like, you know what? Isn't that funny? I, I have not been, I've been blessed to grow up in a Christian home. Um, uh, and, and I, I'm honored and just, that's amazing. But I know others of you have not, and you've been around um, some different experiences around a lot of people that, that may have uh, become drunk or drank too much, or maybe you're in the middle of an experience like that now. Maybe some of you, God has delivered you from that. And that's incredible. I have never seen a person become drunk and then begin to speak fluent French or then begin to sp- speak fluent Hebrew or whatever. I've never seen that, right? It's just, and yet in the middle of this, this was something that was taking place that was so out of the ordinary that the only way that they had in their, their physical minds to explain what was happening was this natural thing to try to explain a spiritual thing. Isn't that interesting? We'll see in a minute. There's actually another verse we're going to see that Paul says that he actually draws this connection to that, that is kind of interesting as well. But there was this moment that happened in this room on the day of Pentecost that was incredibly significant. Important context to understand why this idea of Pentecost is so important for us. Pentecost, the, the, the festival, it was, a, it was a, a time of celebration. It was a festival that the people in that culture celebrated, and it was, it was all tied around harvest. It was all tied around the first fruits of the, the, the grain offerings, very agrarian society, that this festival of Pentecost was a moment that, that they celebrated the harvest. It was, it was a significant thing to them. It was, it was in their Jewish year to commemorate this. It was 50 days, penty, 50, 50 days after the Passover feast is when this took place. It was all about the harvest. You say, well, that's kind of different. How does that apply to us? Well, look around your culture and the world that you're in. We still do similar things in our world. When, when uh, some of you know that my wife and I had roots back in, in Texas, and when we were in East Texas, we were youth pastors of church there in Longview, Texas, deep East Texas, different culture, right? But in East Texas, there was another little town called Gilmer, G-I-L-M-E-R, but you didn't say the L, you just said Gimma. And I don't know why you said it that way, but that's what, I don't know, that's East Texas for you. But they had a festival, and it was called the East Texas Yamboree. And it was the weirdest thing ever. It was like this whole festival to celebrate, celebrate what? Sweet potatoes, like yams, whatever. It was like a big festival. The whole town came out and it was incredible. We were in Missouri the last couple of years living and there's this town called Mount Vernon. And in a few days out of the year, they celebrate, had this festival. It's called the Apple Butter Making Days. You got no G on making, making. It's an apple butter making days. Incredible apple butter. I love it. Well, here locally, Mount Airy, right? Mount Airy has the what? the Apple Festival, right? We have these festivals that we still to this day celebrate, not as much, maybe a little bit. And then, you know, I've looked online, different festivals around Pittsburgh, North Carolina has the Pepper Festival. Well, not necessarily as gimmicky as maybe these might be, but in a larger sense, Pentecost was this festival where people would come together and focus on what? The harvest, Can I tell you this, to this day, that truth still plays out, that genuine Pentecost is always about the harvest. It's always, you say, what do you mean? Sweet potatoes and peppers and apples? No, 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 no. All throughout scripture, Jesus uses the context of what the world would have had, uh, the, their agriculture and their society, to commu- the natural things, to communicate spiritual things. And he was saying to those that were around him, and God, through this plan and through this, this playing out, that this idea of Pentecost You celebrate this physical harvest, but in that moment when you're celebrating that, I'm going to flip the script. I'm going to change the way you think about Pentecost and harvest, and I'm going to pour out my spirit upon you right now so that you'll still have the lens that says Pentecost is all about the harvest. It's about you and I. It's, the, the, the Bible tells us that, that we, as people, before knowing Jesus, we're, we're viewed as the, the, the harvest, the, the, the seeds that were planted in our lives, maybe from praying moms and dads and 
grandmas that, that we're just developing as seeds and, and one day the harvest, us, me, you, and those of us that, are, that have friends and family that don't know Jesus yet, they're the harvest and Pentecost and Pentecostal experience is always about the harvest. Don't ever miss that church. You say, what kind of church are you? We're a Pentecostal church. Well, that means that people should be getting baptized almost every week because the harvest is being, well, we're a Pentecostal church. That means that lives are being changed. That means that there is growth and dynamic. Pentecostal does not necessarily just mean the experience. Pentecost is always about the harvest. Some of you recently, um, and I, I love this because God's drawing people from different uh, walks of life into Calvary Church, even through the welcome home class that we, that we have a, uh, an opportunity to participate and just knowing about Calvary. There's questions that are happening. Well, what kind of, what flavor is Calvary Church? Well, when you say we're a Pentecostal church, there's a lot of people, whoa, what does that mean? You know, whatever. Well, we are also in a, this umbrella of Pentecostal churches. We're an Assemblies of God church. And the Assemblies of God is, is, a, is a lane or a flavor of a Pentecostal church that quite honestly is the largest Pentecostal church movement in the, in the world. When, when you look at the numbers and the growth and all this, it's incredible to see. At the very beginning, 108 years ago, when the Assemblies of God was birthed, it was, it was birthed around this phrase, and that was this idea to be the greatest evangelism force this world has ever seen. What does that mean? That means evangelism is about taking people that don't know Jesus, introducing them to Jesus, and helping them walk in a relationship with Jesus. Evangelism is about that, that furthering of the kingdom of God. And the purpose of this, this tribe, this, this lane of, of church, was to be the greatest evangelism force this world has ever seen. Well, currently, 70 million people all over the world are call themselves Assemblies of God. That's a big deal. You are a part of a great family pursuing the mission of God. I love to see the, the, you, the, the context of where we serve. Calvary Church, every week, um, we're anywhere for this, as far as people that engage weekly, 900 to 1,000 people every week that come and call Calvary Church. This is the moment where they experience a worship experience. And that's just a really small slice of what God is doing through his harvest of, of people through Pentecostal churches. I love some of these numbers. This is just the assemblies of God. This is cool just to, to kind of, hey, what are we a part of? Well, in the U.S., it means it's a little over 3.2 million people. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people to say, you know what? We believe the scripture in this Pentecostal expression, and that's exciting. 12,000 churches when this was printed. When I, I used to work in the National Office of Assemblies of God, and it was over 13,000. It fluctuates in that range, but it's growing in that increase. 37,000 ordained, or not ordained, credentialed ministers in the Assemblies of God, in local churches, in Chi Alpha ministries, in, in Teen Challenge ministries, in different expressions in our missions things all over the world. That's a big deal. This Pentecostal church that you're a part of is not just about, oh, cool, let's look at the experience. The story is continuing in some of these numbers. I love this next one. 40, this is at the time of these stats, 44% of all adherents, those that call themselves Assemblies of God, are ethnic minority. That, change, that has changed and that percentage has gone up and we're almost to the point of saying that it's over 50%. Why is that significant? Because the more that diversity plays out in this tribe, I believe, the more it reflects the body of Christ. And it says to us that they're in a few years and it's... We're getting close. I could go into the details of that, but it's, it's a lot. In a few years, we'll be able to say that there is not one single ethnicity that has a majority in the Assemblies of God. And that's pretty significant. That's awesome to say we are um, a representative of the body of Christ. From an age perspective, 51% of all adherents are under the age of 35, that's pretty significant. People say, oh, you know, it's just a bunch of old people. No, 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 no. God's doing some great things in our seniors and our kids' men and our youth and our students. And God is birthing his church. Why? Because genuine Pentecost is always about harvest. Missionaries all over the world, almost 6,000 missionaries all over the world that God is using this Pentecostal church to, to continue his story. And I love this. Every 62 seconds... 
There's a person that comes to know Jesus in an Assemblies of God church or a missions, missionary type expression, an AG expression all over the world. Every 62 seconds. Thank you, Jesus. That's incredible. We are a spirit-empowered church. We will always be a spirit-dependent church. We must allow this story of Pentecost to continue in our lives. So the rest of our time today, I want to share with you three words. And these three simple words are the context in which the Holy Spirit relates to us. So if you're taking notes and do the little cards there, you can use those on the, the seat pockets in front of you. Three words in the way that the Holy Spirit relates to us. In, I in, with, and through. The Holy Spirit relates to us in, with, and through. Let's talk about the first two for a brief moment, then we'll just kind of land on that third one. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit lives in us. In Romans chapter 8, it says this. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. If you have come to know Jesus, the Holy Spirit is within you. The Spirit draws you to Christ, and then when you ask Jesus to come into your life, say, you know what, I am going this direction, I'm going to do a 180, I'm going to repent. The Bible says that in that moment, the Spirit is in you. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. Paul said it in a different way in 2 Corinthians. He says, so we've stopped evaluating others from a human point of view or a flesh, natural point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from this human point of view. How differently we know him now. Isn't that an incredible statement? This is Paul after the death and resurrection of of Christ. And and this is Paul who had an experience that was an amazing shift and turn in his own life saying, how differently we know him now. We see that not just the natural, the spiritual implication of this. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. We saw the physical representation of the spiritual transformation here today. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. This new life is in the spirit. Somebody says, do you have the spirit of God living in you? And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've accepted him as your savior, the answer is yes. The spirit is in you. Second thing that the spirit does with us is with us. The spirit walks with us. John, in, in his Gospels, he uses this word called paraclete. That's a, an old word that, that, that it used to, to mean a, a comforter, an advocate, a helper to describe the Holy Spirit. Jesus says this in John's Gospel. He says, I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, a comforter, who will never leave you. He's the Holy Spirit, who leads into all truth. Earlier, when I was praying that prayer over our nation, this is a verse that, that comes into my mind, that, that this, this idea of the Holy Spirit leading us into all truth is why our reading scripture is different than just reading a novel or reading any kind of historical account or anything. <clears throat> when you come to the scripture, to the word of God, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth into the word of God. This is truth. That's why it's so important for you to be grounded in God's word because so many times, if we're not careful, we allow other spirits, lowercase s, to lead us into things that are not truth. And when we come to this idea of continuing this story in our lives and the Holy Spirit walking with us, can I tell you, I don't, it doesn't matter how old or young we are or how mature we are, we need to come and approach God's word and say, Spirit, lead us into the truth of God's word and base our life 
on that biblical worldview. This, this past, these past couple weeks, and it doesn't even, uh, it, it's really the world that we're in. It's amazing to me to see us as believers um, allow the different focuses or different narrative, whatever you want to say, of, of world and culture to hijack our conversations so much. Can I tell you that I believe that what would make God happy and Jesus smile would be that we would allow the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth, not what particular focus the world has on or whatever, but we would just say, you know what? The love of God is always there. The truth of God is always there. And we in the church, we have to, there's no option to this. We have to navigate the tension of living according to this truth and being loving and caring in it and yet not being compromising of it. And so many times when we look at different expressions of even God honoring and God fearing people on social media or different things, it seems like we get, get swayed back and forth by whatever the particular conversation is. When I read through scripture, the, the, the Bible says that, that, that God understands and God is love. He is, that's the very embodiment of the word is God, and yet he also is truth. And we as followers of Christ have to, it's not an option, we have to navigate the tension of that love, um, perspective, but also truth. And that the Holy Spirit leads us into all, not just some that makes us feel comfortable, but it leads us into all truth. That's a whole different message, and that's a rabbit trail that I could go on and just really stay there, but we won't. Let's keep going. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. I love this progression that Jesus is saying in this, this verse here. He says that you know you, you, the Holy Spirit is there, but there's something else too. Like, like hold steady, be ready, it's coming, and later will be in you. The Holy Spirit walks with us. Finally, the Spirit acts through us. The Holy Spirit acts through us. Can I tell you this? That if you are a part of a Pentecostal church, which many of you are because you're here and you're a vital part of Calvary, you are a people, you are a person on mission. It is not a spectator sport that you've signed up for just to get a cool welcome home t-shirt, right? I love the shirts, I love it. I don't, but but it's, it's more than that. You are a people on mission. When you go to Target later tonight, or today, when you go to Chick-fil-A, not today, because God's chicken doesn't appear on Sunday, right? So when you go to the restaurant or whatever, there, there is, you're a person on mission. We talked yes, last week about the, the shift of saying, hey, I'll pray for you later to, hey, can I I pray with you right now. I heard several stories, even this week, even today, of people that says, you know what? I put that into practice. And, I, and I, you know what that says to me? It says that we are a people on mission. The Holy Spirit acts through us. Acts chapter one, verse eight. We read it last week, two weeks ago. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses. The power there is for action. So when we come to Acts and this day of Pentecost, this moment of impartation of the Holy Spirit to us, what's the pattern that happens when that takes place? Because if there's a pattern in Scripture and God does not say, which he doesn't in Acts or anywhere else, says, hey, that was just for then there and it's done now. That's not in Scripture. That The pattern in the book of Acts is that really the story continues and so the way he interacts with us and acts through us in this book is very important. Acts chapter two, verse four, we read it. Everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And then we see the church explode. It was not just for them to say, got it, done, finished work, it's over. It was actually the exact opposite of that and said, okay, now ready, go get them, tiger. Now you've got what you need, go be a witness. Because remember, Pentecost is always about the harvest. 
You'll receive power and you'll be my witnesses. It goes on, different verses in Acts. This is the pattern that God showed. Even this is at Cornelius' house, a believer, and he was saying this, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on even the Gentiles. Remember that there's this Jewish Gentile that's just like, oh, Gentiles can receive this? Yeah, everybody. It's, it's everybody can receive this. The Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. How did they know that? For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. It's a pattern in scripture that takes place. You say, well, that's okay. That's two. That's a coincidence. No, it keeps going. And then further on in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 19, Paul's in Corinth and he says, as soon as they heard this, uh, as soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. And there were about 12 men in all. There's a small group there. It was this idea that this tongues was the indicator of something spiritual that was taking place in their life. We read through, we don't have time today to study all the ideas of how tongues is in, 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 uh, involved in the church because if uh, Corinthians and, and different portions in the New Testament talks about the gift of tongues is not just a one-time thing. It's actually uh, described as a language, a prayer language that as believers, after having been baptized in the Holy Spirit, that, that God allows that prayer language for our spirits to, to pray things that we couldn't pray on our own. We don't know what to pray, pray in tongues. That's the point. That, that God wants to connect through your spirit. You say, well, that's a little bit, you know, whatever. Read, read through the, the book of Acts here and how that plays out. And then in Corinthians chapter 12, the gifts of tongues, it's not a one-time thing. Paul gives instructions on worship. Even in our church, we've had moments where people have, have, have given a word in tongues, spoken out a word in tongues, which, which honestly is a, is a biblical manifestation or showing of the work of the spirit. But then there's this gift of interpretation as well. So tongues is a a significant part in the expression of worship in the church. But this first piece, this baptism of Holy Spirit and the initial speaking in tongues is just an indicator of what's happened here. The result of that is the harvest. The result of that is you having impact in the world. That is not to say that the experience is not positive. It is positive, but it's an indicator of what has taken place in our lives. We had some conversations between services about this and just how that sometimes we bring our experiences into this. And can I just tell you, once again, remind, don't bring your life experiences. Look at what the scripture is saying and put this on, on your, your lens as to hear and see what God is doing. This indicator idea is something that I think you'll get it better if I show you a little illustration. And I've got that for you today. I'm going to go all the way back here. Some of you know that I like to use some power tools a little bit. So I'm just going to use a little power tool uh, for some illustrations here. I have some tools at my house that, that are cordless and they have batteries to them. And these, these particular ones have the same, I uh, have two battery packs. These are Milwaukee batteries that go into different tools, right? And these, I was working the other day and using these and they had a really cool illustration. I was like, you know what? That's exactly visually, it, it communicates spiritually what I believe tongues are. So let me just describe this. Um, there's two batteries, they're the same. There's a little bit of a difference to them. The camera guys and, and the team there are gonna help me a little bit. They're gonna try to get real close onto this battery right here. Let me see which one you're at. And this battery right here, if you zoom in really close on this one, if I press this little button here, how close, there you go. If I press this button, did you see the red lights come on right there? Is that, I'm gonna press it again so you see it. The little red lights, that means that battery is full of charge. It is ready to go. Can you see it one more? I let it off and then I'll push it again. That's what I'm, If I go over here to this battery over here and push it, it's, it's dead. It's deader than a doornail as some would say, right? It's dead. It's not there. There's no charge in that. Over here, once again, boom. There's an indicator on this battery that there is, there's a charge in this battery. 
Can I tell you, I've, I grew up in Pentecostal churches all my life, and that I've seen uh, a lot of people, sometimes that's, this is the, what I'm about to describe is why people say, I don't believe scripture because they've seen the batteries, the batteries represented poorly. And sometimes we, if we're not careful, we allow the indicator, the tongues in our life to be such that we would say, do you see my lights? <laughs> those are awesome. <laughs> like, see those batteries over there? This one? No lights, but look at my lights. And we're a church that we believe in lights. Like we're a church, like we have lights all over. Like we love lights, right? And you guys understand the sarcasm with which I'm using this illustration. The lights on this battery are only an indicator of what is taking place inside of this battery. It's only an indicator, right? Now, are those lights, the indicator important? Yes. Because if not, I would look at this and say, you know what, let's go blow the leaves off the driveway and try to use this, and it would not do me any good. But you don't believe me, let's just kind of go back to this little thrill box over here or whatever, and let's say, okay, well, let's see what happens. Because I believe that that's an indicator of some power that goes on in our lives. So when we engage that power, you ready, Don? You better wake up, I'm telling you. So I'm just telling you this. When you do that and there's power, I know that there's power in there. I know there is a wind. Oh, that's, I'll get real Jesus juke on you there. There's a wind of the Spirit that's only because, there you go, Kenda, that's for you. For, oh, yes, there it is. There it is. There's a wind of the Spirit only because those indicators told me that there's a power that's engaging in my life to have an impact on the world. That's the only reason it matters. I love cheesy illustrations because God just does some things. Somebody, it clicks. And I just, even this morning, somebody said, you know what? I got it. That makes sense. Totally understand. Please understand. Please hear me. Tongues are important, biblically, in the life of the church. Tongues interpretation, it's how we, it's how we uh, sometimes know that God is speaking in and to and through us. But that initial sign, that indicator, is all about the result it provides. It's all about me saying that needs to go there and me using that power. It's the indicator of that. Tongues is important. Paul said it this way. He said, don't get hung up on the indicator. In, in, Corinth, in, the, um, in, the book, in his book to the church in Corinth, he said, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but don't have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. He was not saying the tongues were not important, but he said, you know what? There's got to be a balance, and it's, it's an indicator of the impact I have on the world. He also says this, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. That's a bold statement, right? That was him saying, I'm all in. God is doing this through me. But in the church, I'd rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. What was he saying? He was saying to this church that had got out, gotten out of balance. He is saying to a church, don't neglect the gift. It's the indicator of the, 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 the power to be involved in the harvest. Full circle, you remember why this was celebrated at Pentecost? They were thinking harvest. They were thinking natural harvest. God used that moment to impart a spiritual gift to them for a spiritual harvest. Paul goes on to say it this way to the church in Ephesus. I'm going to ask Pastor Clayton and the team to come help me conclude today by this. And we're just going to pray. We're going to pray that God would, would be in us with the Spirit, would be with us, and he would act through us. But Paul said it this way. He said, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. This could be a word to us right in our day. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. This is not about just, oh, got it, done, look at my lights. This is about the harvest. Then he says this, don't be drunk with wine. It's an interesting dynamic that even the early um, people that were around that day of Pentecost, they saw things through the natural lens. They, oh, no, they're just drunk. And Paul saw fit even in his description to the church to draw this distinction 
between these two things, both spiritual and natural. There's a whole different teaching here that I just want to put a seed to maybe allow the Holy Spirit to continue. And I just believe that, that, that God may be challenging some of us to make sure that the focus of our life is upon the filling of the Spirit of God and not anything else that would distract us and would distract others from our witness. So many times we allow things of the world to pull us away from the real purpose. And Paul drew this connection that was really interesting there. He said, don't be drunk with wine because that'll ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The story continues. Would you stand with me all over this room? In just a moment, I'm gonna have the prayer team come forward once again, and we're gonna have a time of prayer, and we're gonna ask the Lord to make the truth of his scripture real in our lives. Some of you, maybe for the first time, you need to ask Christ to come into your life and, and say, boy, I, I need that forgiveness that Jesus allows me to have through, through his death on the cross. He paid the price for your sins, and that's when the Spirit lives in you. Earlier, just a few moments ago, we prayed for those that needed the Holy Spirit to walk with. And maybe you need to respond again to that, and that, that's fine. But then finally, the focus even of today in this idea of Pentecost was that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on that day and today, it's all about the harvest. And yes, tongues is the indicator. And I believe God still does that. And I, I, I speak in tongues. I pray in tongues. When I don't know how to pray, I pray in tongues. And, and, and we as a church, we believe that. But it's the indicator of the infilling to have an impact on this world. And some of you may say, you know what? I just want all that God has for me. And can I just give you some encouragement? Nowhere in this, this word that we read in the scripture did you see people coming to that time and saying they were seeking tongues. They were hearing the message of God and they were responding to God and God gave them that as an, as an opportunity to show them what, what he was doing in and through their life. They weren't seeking that, they were seeking God. And I think that's a pretty amazing pattern for us as well, that God does give us the indicator, but it's in our heart posture of seeking him. And so prayer team, I'm gonna ask you to come one more time. We're working you today and I just believe that would be uh, appropriate way for us to end. Pastor Clayton and the team are gonna sing in just a minute because honestly, you say, well, why do you have to sit? Well, it, even in those moments of scripture, it says they, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they begin to sing songs and, and respond to God. And it's just a one way for us to, to do that as well. And so if you're here today and you say, you know what, Pastor John, I, I believe that this word it continues in my life that this story is not just a great historical perspective, but it's also something that I believe God wants to do in and through me. Um, I want to respond. I want all that the Lord has for me so that I can be a, a more effective, more powerful witness. We've got some people that would love to pray together with you. Here's what I'm believing, that just as the scripture said that Paul, when he laid his hands on them and, and prayed for them, they received the Holy Spirit, they were filled, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know what? That still happens today. That still happens today. And I believe that God can do that in and through our lives. Holy Spirit lives in you. Holy Spirit is with you and he acts through you. And so very specifically, if you're joining with us online and you want to respond to these, these areas of response, specifically for those that, that maybe you've never begun your relationship with Jesus, we'd love to connect with you. You can do that virtually and you can click that little button and our campus pastors would love to, to just talk with you. Those of you that are in the room, if that's the, the desire of your heart, these that are up front have the ability and the, the training and the knowledge just to lead you in that prayer as well. It's just as simple as saying, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. I believe that you paid the price for those sins and please forgive me. And I wanna live my life for you from this day forward. If you would love for someone just to join with you in that prayer or that you just, man, I just need the Holy Spirit acting through me in a more significant, powerful way. We would love to pray with you. Let me pray for you. And then after I say this prayer, um, if you would want to respond and agree together with us, we'd love for you to do that as well. Father, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would work. 
God, I pray that you would remove any distractions in the room and that, God, that still small voice that speaks to our hearts, would you allow us to have the courage to respond? That, God, I understand that sometimes that physical step leads to a spiritual breakthrough. And I pray that you would do that in and through our lives today. We thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. If you would love for us to pray with you today, we would love to do that as well. Come as we sing this song together.